this morning, as I was thinking about what I was sharing, I uh, felt the Lord leading me to kind of just focus on, I was going to focus on two things. Uh, I've talked quite a bit about uh, how Acts chapter 15, and really all of, all of Acts, begins to highlight very clearly what saves a person, right? What does a person need to do to be saved? And, uh, and I was going to share a little bit more about that this week again, and just hit on that. And that's something, we're saved by faith alone, right? We're, we're saved by faith alone in Jesus Christ. And we, you're probably getting almost a little tired of that. I want to encourage you um, that I want to be very clear about that, not because I think that some of you aren't saved, right? I want to be very clear about that so that it's so rooted in your thinking that you can teach others about that clearly, right? Because I think so many people have a misunderstanding about what a person needs to do to be saved. And so many people look at the church and they think, well, they seem to think that they're going to be saved because of how they live. And that's not, we're not saved by how we're li we live. How we live honors or dishonors the Lord. The choices we make either honor or dishonor the Lord. And if you're living a life that deliberately dishonors the Lord, it, it's pretty clear where you're at with Him, right? And if you're, if you're living a life that is intentionally endeavoring to honor the Lord, it's pretty clear where you're at with Him, right? And so I, I, I don't want to... I, I, I was going to spend some time again focusing on that. What is a person... And I'm just going to say it very quickly this morning... The thing that saves us is our belief. And you know how you know? And how, what, what Peter's, Peter's arguing in this passage for that? Because you have the Holy Spirit. Because you have the Holy Spirit. Right? And, and, and Peter says that in Acts 15.8. And I'm going to just read it quickly. God who knows the heart. So it's what you believe. It's where your heart is at. Showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. So what Paul kind of, or Peter is concluding, and Paul and Barnabas as well, is that if a person has the Holy Spirit, then that means that they must have believed. And if they believe, then that means they're saved. So if you have the Holy Spirit, it, it means two things. It means that you must have believed, and the Spirit is evidence of that belief. But it also means that you're saved, and the Spirit is evidenced, evidence that you're saved. In fact, Jesus or, or um, uh, Paul explains this further, and he talks about how the Spirit is a guarantee. What is it guaranteeing? It's guaranteeing that you're saved, right? So this, the fruit of the Spirit and the evidence of the Spirit of God working in your life and convicting you and, 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 and kind of pushing on your heart and saying, hey, look, this is, where, well, this is where you need to change. This is where you need to grow. Here's the things that you need to focus on for joy and hope. And the work of the Holy Spirit in your life is evidence that one, you believe and that you're saved. So a person doesn't need to, and I want to encourage you, a person doesn't need to do works. Pay attention to that. But if the Spirit of God is in you, and the Spirit of God is all about doing works, for the glory of Jesus Christ and the glory of the Father, what does that mean that your life's going to be engaged in? I'm going to say that again. If the Spirit of God is in you, and if you notice, the Spirit of God all the way through Scripture is engaged in doing things, doing works for the glory of the Father. The Spirit of God was at work through the prophets. And what were the prophets doing? The prophets engaged in proclaiming truth and doing stuff for others, doing miracles, doing, you know, giving, sharing, they're giving their lives, they're even in, uh, willing to endure extreme persecution. Why? Because the Spirit of God was upon the prophets. The Spirit of God, when the Spirit of God's present, you're, you're, that's His purpose, is to glorify Jesus Christ. The, we see the, the apostles in the early church already, even though we're in 15 books right? 15, 15, 15 chapters of Acts. The Spirit of God is present, and what are the apostles doing? The apostles are engaged in doing works that glorify the Father, that, and, and in terms of proclaiming truth, loving on people, healing, those kind of things. The Spirit of God is in you. You're going to have a desire to be engaged in 
doing things that glorify Jesus Christ and highlight Him as the Savior of the world, right? A person then needs to ask themselves, not so much, well, am I saved? A person needs to ask myself, do I see evidence of the Spirit of God working within me? And am I open to that? Am I open to that? And of course, those three things are all connected, right? Spirit of God, salvation, belief. Now, Romans says, Romans, Romans says, the just shall live by faith. So then the question is, and I don't know if any of you watched the thoughts from the pastor this week. It's supposed to be really short. When I was done, it was about 20 minutes long. Forgive me. But the question is, okay, are you living by faith? Are you living by faith? Is that a question that pops into your mind before you do and you might say, well, before I do what? Before you do anything. Before you go talk to your neighbor, are you going, okay, by faith, I believe what the Bible says about my neighbor. And that's that they need Jesus and that God loves them dearly. So by faith, when I talk to them, I'm going to just engage. I'm going to be bold. I'm going to talk about Jesus. I'm going to glorify Jesus in my conversation. Why? Because the Spirit of God is within me. And what's the Spirit of God engaged in doing? Glorifying Jesus. Jesus said that. We looked at that earlier on in Acts, right? Glorifying Jesus. So then are you like, okay, by faith, guys, by faith is a huge thing you need to have when you're a pastor. When people come to you and say, okay, this is what's going on in my family, and, and I don't know what to do about it. I'm like, well, okay then, by faith, I have to go, okay, by faith, Lord God, grant me wisdom. Bring to mind scripture that applies to what they're dealing with. Lord God, help me say stuff that isn't there going to go, okay, I'm going to do that. And then, and then their family is just completely destroyed. Well, how come? Well, they, I listened to the pastor and look what happened. Right? So by faith is something that I, I need to be engaged in thinking through, and I don't all the time. I mean, when someone comes to me into my office and says, okay, this is what's going on, or they come over to my house and say, okay, this is what's going on. Okay, then, I mean, there's obviously like a pretty pillar, big pillar there that kind of goes, okay, Adam, you can't lean on your own power here. You have to do this by faith. Okay? But then just throughout the week, do I do that? I've always, I often forget. By faith, how do I talk to my wife? Well, but I believe that God wants me to be a husband that leads her closer to Him. Right? By faith, how do I talk to my kids? By faith, do I believe that as I talk and as I share and as I even discipline in those things, that the Spirit of God will be working powerfully within me? Right? I need to be living by faith. Recognizing that listening to, following, being aware of the Spirit of God who's going to be present within me, pushing me, maybe quietly, maybe quietly, but pushing me towards the things that bring glory to Jesus Christ in all that I do. And I want us to understand that, right? So that when someone says to you, and so this is interesting, guys, because um, thoughts from the pastor last week... <coughs> Or a couple weeks ago, actually, someone uh, messaged me on Facebook and said, but you have to be engaged in works to be saved. Because a huge part of the world still believes and still holds on to this fact that you have to be engaged in works to be saved. Yes, you know Jesus, but unless you're doing, you're going to church, unless you're, you're doing this, you're doing that, you're doing that, you're not saved. You're not going to heaven. And so I want us to understand very clearly that, that those things are not true, Right? But I also want to engage us and say, okay, no, no, no. We are, we are made for works. We are made, Ephesians, Ephesians talks about this. We are made for good works. But we are saved by faith, by belief, by an act of belief in Jesus Christ. Okay? That, and so, so why do I say, why do I talk about this this morning? Because, guys, when it comes to chapter 15 and the Jerusalem Council, that is like the key, the key thing that they're trying to work through. They're trying to understand, okay? That's the key argument that they're trying to kind of settle. And so it's a profound, it's a profound conversation that the early church is having that affects all the way throughout history. And it's ironic that we still see all the way throughout history the church either leaning way towards grace, well, it doesn't matter what I do, I believe. But then you look at their lives and you see no fruit of the Spirit. 
You see no patience. You see no kindness. You see no those kind of things, the fruits of the Spirit. And that idea that, well, it's only by faith then becomes freedom to live however I want. And yet you don't see in people's lives an actual presence of the Spirit of God where when you look at their life, you see their actions and their actions consistently bring glory to Jesus. Their words consistently bring glory to Jesus. That, 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 you see the church struggle with that. You see much of the ch church guys in our day struggling with that, right? Where it becomes belief in Jesus, but there is actually no concern about holiness. There's no concern about the things that Jesus represents. Or we see all the way through history the church going the other way. And even though we recognize that it's by faith alone in Jesus Christ, the church goes the other way, and what does it become? Well, it becomes you, you can't drink and you can't smoke and you can't... That's, 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 that's what I got. I guess drugs nowadays. Drugs are legal, so there's some drugs you can, you're, you know, but you can't do those. And you can't, uh, you can't, you know, give blood or take blood and you can't, you can't be married and be a, be a priest. You can't, you know, all these things that you can't do. And now, and now some of those things are actually quite good things. They're, they're, they're smart things. I think alcohol is a good thing where your person has to be smart, right? So there's some, there's some warning in Scripture about some of those things, but then we make it about the rules. Why? Because we can actually keep rules. It's easy to keep the rules, especially the ones that we find easy to keep, right? And so we, find, we, we make a list of rules that we can keep, and then we make... We make those the rules that you have to be a Christian to follow. And you see the church does, does that too and has done that all the way through history. Okay? And so understanding what is taking place uh, in terms of, of, of what's happening in chapter 15, that it's about grace alone in Jesus Christ when you believe and when you've received the Holy Spirit. So those, are, those three are all connected and they need to be connected. Okay? And we need to understand that. We need to be able to share that with people, right? And we need to be able to do that clearly. Because, why, well, then how come I see that one guy, how come I see that one guy, he goes and he eats in the bar? He's supposedly a Christian, right? How, how come I see that? Obviously, he's not a Christian. And the world goes, so I don't understand it, because those guys say, I guess if he's, he's on this side of the stage, he's more liberal in that area, right? <clears throat> I see him eating in the bar, he's doing that, but those guys over there say that if you do that, well, then you're not a Christian. So, like, it's just so confusing, right? And I, I think that probably the majority of the world looks at the church and they see that we're all Christians here. There's the ones that go to the bar and have a beer, and then, and then that's okay. And then there's the other ones that say, no, you can't do that. You're going to hell because of that. There's ones that say, and there's ones that actually go to their freedom way off the edge, right? That they have gone with the idea of freedom in Jesus so far off the edge that even though the, the, the Word of God and the New Testament clearly say these people will not be in heaven. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. If you do this, if you do this, if you do this, you won't. But they're like, no, it's okay now because that's, that's, that's old. Now God's okay with that now. And, and the people step back and they look at all these and they go, what? Man, that is so screwed up. Those guys don't know what they're doing. And I don't want you to, to, to I, I want you to be able to say, okay, no, no, this is why we have this problem. Understand this. That is by faith alone in Jesus Christ that you are saved. And, when God, and God knows the heart. And when you believe, the Spirit of God is given to you. And when the Spirit of God is given to you, you are saved. So those that would go to church, those that would engage in the Christian religion and would agree with the Bible and yet still not submit their life to Jesus, those that would, like Jesus says, many in that day will say, Lord, Lord, we did this and we did that and we did this, but yet they won't go to heaven, right? They're doing it because they think, hey, these are the things I need to do to be Saved. These are the things I need to do so that I go to heaven. 
Right? We can explain to people why there are people that make a whole bunch of rules. We can explain to people why people, there are people that go too far into freedom. We can explain that because we believe it is by faith alone in Jesus Christ that saves us. But we always connect works as evidence of that saving, which we should, which we should, but we have to be careful that we don't go so far into that and just judging works that we think that we come to the place that we believe that works save us. That is the profound mistake that so many people, and, that, and as we as humans, are prone to make. That is why there is such a wide stage, so to speak, in the Christian belief system, right? In the end, we need to know Jesus, and we know Jesus in the heart, by believing that he is who he says he is and that he has done what he said he, is, he, he would do and he's done that for me personally, right? And I want us to hear that so much that it becomes kind of like a second nature for us to explain that for the people around us, right? That's all I'll say, but I ended up probably sharing more than I was going to in that section anyway. So that's something that I want to share. I want us to be consistently thinking about and, and, and paying attention to. And maybe even testing our own hearts, right, about specific belief, the presence of the Holy Spirit, understanding that the Holy Spirit is going to be constantly aiming towards glorifying Jesus Christ. And if I am keeping in step with the Spirit, if I am listening to the Spirit, my words, my actions, my life will be dependent on me questioning myself listening to the Spirit, saying, is my actions in this situation, are, are my actions, sorry, in this situation, are they glorifying Jesus Christ? Because that becomes what is most important to you in your life as the Spirit of God works and matures us closer to Jesus, right? Okay. The second thing that we have been talking about is conflict because this passage, because of that debate actually reveals a lot of great steps towards dealing with conflict. Conflict, And I'm going to go through them very quickly. Uh, we've talked about, number one, find the fruit of the fight, and that deals with kind of looking within ourselves to really figure out what is the problem here. Why do I have an issue in this conflict? Number two is seeking our highest source. This has to do with being, when I engage a conflict, the first thing I should do is be like, hey, there's things I need to learn here. There's th things I need to learn here. I, I might not know everything here. I, there's things I need to learn. I need to go and seek a, high, a higher source or the highest source. Number three, we pray about it before we fight about it. As followers of Jesus Christ, before we speak, and oh boy, do sometimes do we just want to speak, hey? Hey, husbands. Hey, wives. Hey, hey kids. You know? You just want to, yeah, but this, right? You want to bring up something. Before I do that, before I engage the fight, I pray about it. Now, as your pastor, I just want to be very clear. I, I don't do great at that one. So, you know, and I thank the Lord for his grace in that one. But that is what we need to engage doing more and more and more. God is working in my life in that area. And I pray that as we talk about it and as we hear it, that God begins to do uh, uh, more and more of a work in your own life, too, if you struggle with that in that area. Number four, we flip the rock. We go to the other side. We find out what the other person is actually engaged in. We don't just assume and listen to other people. We go and talk to the other person. We flip the rock. Go see what's on the other side. Number five, we come together and we are open to truth and truthfully open. Right? We endeavor to come together, to bring all involved together, and to work through what is taking place. And we see that that's exactly what they did in chapter 15 in the council. They came together, they talked, they, they endeavored to be open to truth and truthfully open. Number six, we talked about testing the testimony. In our day and age, I think this one applies so much. Talking to Susanna several times this week, I'm like, hey, that's test the testimony, Right? We have to do that with the news we're listening to. We have to do that with, uh, with, with the people that we're, we talk to in terms of their perspectives and stuff. Well, I heard this. Well, I heard that, right? Uh, Susanna was talking with someone about COVID, and the lady's like, oh, I heard that, we're this, that they're making rules so that this is going to stay with us forever. 
that we're always going to have these, these rules. And Susanna's like, I don't think I've heard that, but test the testimony, right? Don't just assume that, that the, what a person is saying is true. Test the testimony. Are they reliable witnesses? Are they reliable witnesses? Or have they lied in the past? We have a great example of this, okay? Who said they're not going to invade? Yeah. Who said we have no... We have no intent to go into the country. Who said we're only running practices, right? And we're going to leave. We're drawing back now, right? Two weeks later, test the testimony. So next time he says something, right? Next time Putin says something, should we be so excited to be like, okay, good? No. The testimony is, is, is we see his testimony, right? It's a, akin to Hitler's. No, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. We're good. Peace treaties. And then just doing what he wants, right? But guys, we can, look at, we can look at rulers, and they're on a much bigger stage, but we do the same kind of things in little ways, right? We do the same kind of things in little ways, right? We need to recognize what is our testimony. Do I speak in a way, do I act in a way that I am trustworthy in what I say? This is a big one. This is a big one. In this area of, of saying, okay, I forgive you. Right? I forgive you. So is my testimony strong in that area? When I forgive someone, I forgive them. Right? It's huge for us. Or even saying, I'm sorry. I have a little one that says this, and I'm not going to preach this whole message again. I have other stuff to share, but... These are huge things, guys. I have a little, little guy that's learned to say sorry. Sorry. And I say it like that because I know whenever he says it like that, he just doesn't want to get in trouble. And he thinks if I say sorry, I can just go and do whatever, and it's done. Oh, sorry. And it just bugs me so much. And, I'm, and I keep telling, do you know what sorry means? Sorry means... I feel bad, I realize I'm wrong, I won't do it again, or at least I'll try not to do it again. That's what sorry means. So I'm like, in this, I'm sorry. Do you realize that you're wrong? Do you feel bad? And are you going to endeavor to not do that again because of the result of it? Are you actually sorry? Are you actually sorry? Or is it just a good way to like, okay, my wife, she's going to talk about this. She's mad at me. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. And I'm just going to go do my own thing. And then two days later, if she gets mad at me again, and I don't know what it is. Maybe you're leaving your socks on the, the floor, right? Or maybe you're, you like, uh, you know, getting out of the shower and the, and the water's all wet and the floor's all wet. Whatever it might be. But you know, you know the things. Do I just say, oh, sorry, and then go on my way, and I'm going to do it again, and I don't really care? Or am I truly sorry in a way that, you know what, I will intentionally endeavor to change what I need to change, seek the Lord. I will try to move heaven and earth, because I realize that is wrong, and I'm going to try not to do it again, right? That's sorry, Test the testimony. Is that, is that my testimony? Is that my testimony? Okay, number seven. Go to the word as we live out the word. That we go to the word. Yes, we use the word of God to support our perspectives, but then we also make sure that we're living out the word of God while we do that. Are we doing that in conflict? This morning, I want to talk about number, number nine, okay? And it's a little bit of a bigger one. And we, uh, as we read already in, in this passage... We recognize uh, that James steps up and he, he speaks to this conflict. And James in verse 19, 15, 19 says, It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from fruit, food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. 
Then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. So they chose Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, men who were leaders among the believers. With them they sent the following letter. The apostles and elders, your, your brothers, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, Syria and Cilicia. Greetings. Have you heard that some of, we have heard that some have some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, tr uh, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose some men and se send them to you with our dear friend Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. It seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. Now, one of the first questions one might ask is, in this whole debate about salvation by faith alone, and that we don't really have to worry about works in terms of the do's and don'ts when it comes to salvation. We need to first worry about believing truly, being filled with the Holy Spirit, and knowing we are saved. That is, that, uh, that is at the core of that. Then, then one might say, then why does James list four things for the Gentiles not to do? Maybe you haven't thought about that, but if the debate here, what the core of the, the, the conflict is, is what must a person do to be saved, and then let, let the Spirit of God do the work after why does he still list four things? It seems perhaps that maybe he is pushing back a little bit, right? Or maybe even going against what they had just concluded. That Gentiles are saved by faith alone in Jesus Christ. The key is to note verse 21. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. Why does he note that? It seems like an interesting statement. He's not making a new law. But he is doing two things here. One, he is clarifying some of the key truths that are consistent with God's holiness and are repeated again and again throughout the Old Testament. That's why he says, For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. So he knows that if you, if you know, if you're, if you're a Jew and you're a Christian and you know the law, you know that these four things are, are kind of key things that God always is pushing back against. And why? Well, sex or sexual immorality makes sense, right? Because that doesn't lead to holiness. But also pay attention that the other three are connected to the practices of idolatry and sorcery, right? Drinking blood, eating blood, those kind of things. That, that's connected to sorcery and idol worship. So what, the first thing that James is saying, and, and, and the whole congregation as they're led by the Spirit is saying, first of all, stay away from these things because they don't lead to holiness. So there's a drive towards holiness in, what, in their conclusion. But also note that the council is aiming to help both sides walk in holiness and love-driven unity. Okay, there is, there is this drive towards love and unity going on also in this passage. And that's why he says to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, animals that are strangled, eating animals that are strangled, and blood, meaning eating and drinking blood. And we understand this because we recognize that eating meat is not a sin. Eating meat that have been sacrificed to idols is not actually a sin. It's not, James in the council isn't saying, okay, if you believe in Jesus and you do these four things, then you're saved. That's not what's happening. What they're saying is, if you believe in Jesus and you aim towards holiness, if you aim towards holiness, love and unity, you are wise to do these things. Okay? So this is why. This is why we understand this. Because we also know that Paul says very clearly that meeting, eating, meat, eating meat that is sacrificed to idols isn't wrong. You remember that? 1 Corinthians 8, 7 uh, to 12 says this. But note, sorry, but not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat, eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a god. 
And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we, if we, don't, if we, if we do not eat, and no better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. So Paul here is saying, even though James said, don't eat meat sacrificed to idols, in his list, the council did, Paul here is saying, whether you eat meat sacrificed to idols or not, that doesn't actually make you more Christian or less Christian. But, he says, but, be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights or freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you with all your knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be an emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister from whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. Then, When you sin against them in this way, you wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. So in saying, well, I have freedom here, I'm going to do whatever. Well, by faith in Jesus Christ, there is freedom from the law. There is freedom from the do's and the don'ts. But our freedoms should always be pointing to holiness and love focused in unity, focused in unity. Paul notes here that eating meat that was sacrificed to an idol is not necessarily wrong. However, Paul's point is that if there are others who, not having your understanding and weaker in the faith, see you eating meat sacrificed to idols in an idol's temple and fall into that sin, you have sinned against them and Jesus Christ. So yes, we have freedom in Christ. We are not saved by works of the law but we are to use our freedom to bring unity towards holiness and love. And look at Paul's attitude in verse 13. Look, 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 look what he says. Okay, now this is how it applies to conflict, guys, so be careful. Be, be paying attention to this. He says, Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause them to fall. Now bring that into conflict. Bring that attitude into conflict. Paul and I believe, James and the church council in, in chapter 15, understand that, yes, we have freedom in Christ, but if any action in my life is not towards holiness and loving others towards unity, then those actions are sin. I'm going to say that again. Yes, we have freedom in Jesus Christ, but if any action in my life is not towards holiness and loving others towards unity, then those actions are sin. Apply that to our understanding of conflict and how we engage conflict. Right? So the, the council lists these four things. Why? For two reasons, really. One, because it's holiness. And the second one is because it's bent towards love and unity. See, the council understands that the Jews that are Christians would not be okay with accepting the Gentiles practicing these things. And it makes sense. Why? Because the law of Moses has been read in the synagogues from the earliest times. We understand already what directs us towards holiness and what is directed towards evil. Sexual immorality is directed towards evil. Sacrificing things to idols and engaging in idol worship and drinking of blood and the things that are done uh, by, by those that practice evil things, that does not bring holiness. So, so, so they, they are recognizing that the Jews will have a problem with that. But they also just list these four things. Why? Because they understand that the young believers, the young Gentiles, won't be able to handle a list of 500 things that don't lead to holiness. And we know that there's large lists. There's longer lists, right? Because Paul gives us in his writing way longer lists than those four things, right? So the question then is, as we engage, or, or the point here is that, that, that we need to look at in this passage and through this, is that when we are in conflict, are we aiming towards holiness? Are we aiming towards love? And are we aiming towards unity? And guys, this is actually a huge point. Why? 
Because when Jesus Christ was in conflict with us, how he dealt with the conflict we had with God and Jesus Christ was to, by aiming towards holiness, acting in love, and working towards unity. Listen to Romans 5, 6, and, 7, and to 11. You see, just at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Guys, without Jesus, that's us. We are the ungodly without Jesus. All those without Jesus are the ungodly, but also we have to recognize we are the ungodly without Jesus. Verily, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemy, we were in conflict with God, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Now, not only in this, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received reconciliation. Through whom we have received reconciliation. Right? So Jesus Christ dealt with the conflict that we had with him. Number one, by aiming towards holiness. Number two, by acting in love. And number three, by endeavoring to move the conflict towards unity. And what did that take for him? That took going to the cross, suffering, dying. So I want to ask you guys this, because this is at the root of what Jesus Christ has done for us in the conflict that we had with him. This is actually at the root of the salvation in the gospel message. This is how Jesus Christ deals with conflict. When's the last time that you've been in a conflict with your wife, with your neighbor, with your husband, with your kids, with your whatever, and you were willing to go to the cross? Right? In our conflicts, guys, in our conflicts, because Jesus Christ lives within us, we should be engaged in the same action that Jesus Christ was willing to engage in when it came to the conflict with us. Jesus Christ didn't go to the, to, the, to, to, to the cross to prove he was right. In fact, as he hung on the tree, it looked very much like he was wrong. That's why they jeered him, right? That's why they jeered at Jesus. Because the Messiah of God, would ne this would never happen to the Messiah of God. That's what they concluded. Jesus Christ hanging on the, on the cross, dying, this would never happen to the Messiah of God. Therefore, this fool is wrong. And we were right. Even though we gave him a fake trial and we had witnesses that were lying, and in the end, he, we got him sentenced to death for nothing, nothing that he did wrong. Even though we did it all wrong, we were right. Why? Because the Messiah, this would never happen to the Messiah. In your conflicts, are you willing to hang on the cross and to be, to be beaten and suffer and, 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 and have all that stuff happen to you? Because in the conflict, your aim isn't to win. Your aim is to live out holiness, act in love, and endeavor to unite, to live united, and reconcile the relationship with the person you're arguing with. In conflict, do you take the conflict to the cross? Lesson number eight. And the truth that we need to remember because it's at the root of the gospel message. We need to ask ourselves, am I willing to suffer? And am I willing to die in this conflict? Am I willing to look wrong even? To aim for holiness, to act in love, and to live out unity. Am I willing to bring the conflict to the cross? Right? Am I willing to bring the conflict to the cross? In our conflicts as followers of Jesus Christ, let us be willing to suffer, to die even, to look like we're wrong even. Even, guys, even this, even this, pay attention, even to spend some time in the grave. Right? Even to spend some time in the grave. Jesus' resurrection happened three days later. 
God might not let you have that victory three days later. It might take years. It might take years. But are you willing, even in conflict, to not prove yourself right, but be willing to say, okay, no. I'm going to entrust my spirit into God's hands, entrust this conflict into God's hands. I'm going to aim for holiness. I am, despite anything, going to act in love, and I'm going to work towards unity and the reconciliation of this relationship. Right? Let us, this week, as we engage our conflicts, let us do it like Jesus did it. Let's, take it, let's be willing to take it to the cross, to forgive the other person even while they are still sinning against us, just like Jesus Christ forgave us while we were still sinners. Let us be willing to give up ourselves, to suffer, and, to suffer in the hope and by faith that God will use what we do and how we live in holiness and love towards reconciling the re- relationship, right? Let us be aimed to help the weaker. And in, in for order for us to do this, we will have to, like Jesus did, commit our spirit, commit our words, commit our action, commit our lives into his hands and to trust what he is going to do. Because that's exactly what Jesus did for us.